Okay, hi. <laughs> so I'm Judith Marin. Thanks for the introduction, Dan. So this is, was a project, I should actually say it, like this was a project that has been going on for ever and ever. I think that we started doing like the patient uh, pain algorithm in probably tw 2008, 2009. And to come out with all these algorithms now, it's kind of like just a continuum. And you'll see in there that we're still thinking about doing more, so it might never stop, actually. Um, so these are the learning objectives. Like what I want to focus on today is just to review what is the process that I've been going through with these algorithms to show you a few um, of how they should be used and also to present the tools that are available on the website. So we'll show you all actually how to find them on the website. Oops. There you go. And so we have these lovely life polls. So please take out your phone. What do you think? And that is what uh, Yvonne and I are aspiring for when we're older. <laughs> we're hoping we won't need these algorithms. So at which stage of CKG, of CKD do you think the symptoms related to renal failures are occurring? And so I guess I should give you a few seconds to answer. Does everybody has their answer their um, answer entered? Here, let's just check it out. How is that working? Okay. So a few, stage three, stage four, 33%. It's actually quite a diversity of percent. That's good. OK. OK. And then which of these symptoms do you think is the most frequently encountered in CKD patients? And so is it true or false that the BC Renal Agency extended some of the drug coverage for patients with GFR lower than 15 amount per minute for the medication that are used for symptom management? Some people have read their communication. Good job. <laughs> OK. Oopsie. OK. So just to give you a bit of background, like CKD is, uh, symptoms related to CKD are very common. They usually start at CKD stage four. But then as the patient progress, these symptoms are like are getting to be more and more cumbersome. And then usually the actually impact quality of life when patients are about CKD stage five, or that's what is most reported in the literature. They usually don't come as one. They usually come as multiple symptoms. And it doesn't, like the quality of life is not only because of some physical symptom, but it's also because of some psychological and emotional symptoms. And this take a toll not only on the patient, but the whole family. Uh, and it's been reported in multiple times that the symptoms burden that is seen in that population is similar to what is seen in terminal cancer or end stage heart failure. So the symptoms that we're seeing, like the, it's not one symptom, it's a lot of symptoms. And it's a lot of symptoms being seen in like more than 50% of the patient. Fatigue being the one that we see the most often, like close to 90% of patients uh, managed conservatively are reporting being tired. Itch is also one that we see very often, drowsiness, breathlessness, anxiety, and then pain is like, uh, the 50% mark is like here. So like dry mouth, even feeling depressed, like crossing the 50% mark. So a lot of symptoms being uh, seen by a lot of patients. And one thing that is very important is working at the kidney care center, like we gauge on when to start dialysis based on these symptoms. But these symptoms are not totally disappearing when dialysis is started. Like that's um, that's one of the survey that was done in dialysis patient, and still 70% of the patient were reporting some fatigue, 50% of them reporting some itchiness, poor appetite. So it seems like some of the patients are having a decrease in the symptom, but there is still quite a lot that are actually experiencing these symptoms even after dialysis is started. 
So in, at the end of uh, 2015, uh, the uh, Kidney Care Ad uh, Advisory Committee recommended that uh, the ESAS to be implemented in all kidney care clinic. So that patient that have an EGFR lower than 50 ml per minute would be assessed for symptom management. And with that recommendation was uh, basically they added that some algorithms should be done so that we can standardize the approach for patients that are symptomatic, but also increase the accessibility for the appropriate therapy for these patients. And so we did a big consultation group with, uh, with the, like our nephrology team so nephrologists, renal dietitian, nephrologists, but also specialists in other specialty like palliative care specialists and also dermatologists, depending on which algorithm we're talking, we were considering doing. And so at the end of the day, we decided to do eight algorithms. The first one here are actually symptoms that are looked after in the ESAS. So fatigue, nausea, poor appetite, pain, pruritus, restless legs are actually evaluated systematically through the ESAS. But the constipation one and the muscle cramp one were not, but we thought that these were symptoms that were seen so regularly in our patient that these were actually worthwhile doing. We decided, to, so in the ESAS there is three different uh, kind of category for fatigue. There is fatigue, drowsiness, and sleeping problem. We kind of lumped them all together into a fatigue algorithm. And then the next step, the ones that have not been uh, done are like the shortness of breath algorithm, anxiety. However, saying that we have an antidepressant guideline uh, algorithm that is for CKD patient. And then there is also like the feeling of well-being, but that's a bit more difficult to address. Not saying that it cannot be done, but probably we'll have to link with the social worker group for this to be done. Uh, no. Whoops. Okay. Whoopsie. And so, based on that, we just we started the big work. It took probably about eighteen months to come up on some consensus for all these algorithm and guidelines. Um, all the BCPRA subcommittees were have advice, have given their uh, comments on the algorithm. It was also reviews by, reviewed by the executive committee and by the BC Pharmacy and Formulary Committee. And then at the end, we begged the Pharmacy and Formulary Committee to increase drug coverage for the patient that were going that were at the end of their. CKD non-dialysis journey, and either we're deciding to go conservative care versus going for dialysis because the burden for the the symptoms burden for these patients is quite high, and we wanted to make sure that they that financially getting access to these medication was not a problem. So we went to the pharmacy and formulary for that, and that request was approved. So all of this came together in August 2017, so just a couple of months ago. So finally, uh, everything is now all accessible on the BCPRA website, the algorithms, the patient information sheet, but also the medication information sheet. Uh, the BCPRA formulary was updated with uh, also uh, aligning the uh, the uh, first line therapy that we had with what is what is on the formulary. So we aligned the formulary with the algorithm, and that was sent also to all the contracted community pharmacy. And all the information sheet for the medication covered are now also available on the BCPRA website. And so you'll hear me talking about algorithm versus guidelines. And so some of the the algorithms that we decided to do had a lot of evidence behind them, and it was actually quite easy to trace like how we should proceed to guide treatment, but some of them there was nothing. And then it became like how should we guide clinicians to decide which therapies are the most appropriate with the other. So we decided to call these documents guidelines, and there's no rating, there's no Nothing, but and then the choice of therapy are mostly based on what is the safest for the patient rather than the efficacy. And in these, and uh, I'm going to show you one of the algorithm, and Yvonne will show you one of the guidelines, and you'll see the design of it is actually quite different. And for the uh, guidelines, we don't really specify an order for the suggestion; we just basically make suggestion and leave it to the clinician to decide 
what is the most appropriate for the patient. And so, moment of, very, of truth, we'll see if this works. And a couple of days ago, the BCPRA website was down, so I'm just hoping that everything will work out today. So if you want to go and find all the algorithms, it's through the health professional section. And then you go to symptom assessment and management. And then that's where you find the ESAS in different language. And then let's just take uh, the muscle cramp, for example. And then you have the patient information tool. You have the algorithm. And then some of the medication that are suggested for these indications uh, and are covered by the PRA website, the patient information sheet are also available there. So it's actually quite easy to find all the information, even when you see a patient, if you're doing a consultation. On the patient side, they can actually also find information if they go into the um, health info section. And then if they scroll down to the medication and uh, in the condition and treatment, they have like all the different all the different symptoms are actually integrated into this. So if I look at itchy skin, the patient information sheet is there and also all the, pa the medication info sheet of what is covered by PRA are there. So it's actually quite easy to find all the information. So it's now time to go through a case. And that's actually a patient who just started dialysis in my unit. Wonderful man. <laughs> um, so 72-year-old man who has tons of comorbidities. Um, his EGFR has been around 10 ml per minute for quite some time. Um, and he's actually doing pretty good. He finally decided to consent for a uh, fistula. Um, but, but we know that we're a little bit late in the game. All his symptoms when we're doing the ESATs are zero. But now things are starting to move a little bit. And it's actually like we've been doing it, the, we've been doing the ESAS at St. Paul's quite regularly, I would say for probably the last 12 months. And it's actually quite telling how like patients are zero, zero everywhere, zero everywhere, and then everything s switch. And then that's where usually the next appointment, they're just like, we're ready to start. <laughs> so when things are switching is when like we know that we need to keep a closer eye, a closer eye on them. And so all these symptoms, like he's basically saying that he's asymptomatic, but then he started saying that, you know what, pruritus is becoming more a problem and fatigue. So how should we proceed? And how fantastic, we have a DSERP PRA pruritus algorithm. Oh, shoot. Wait a minute. Oh. Oh, here you go. Oh, no. Oh, no. I broke. I broke the thing. Uh, oh, the lady there. No. You know, Cliff, you know how this works. Because I have it on the computer here. They just don't see it. Is this like a control F something? Oh, here you go. Thank you. Perfect. <coughs> awesome. So here is the, the out, so the, well, as you probably know, there is a lot of data on pruritus. Like, I mean, a lot. And there is a lot of poor trials, and there is a lot of, um, yeah, there's just a lot of things on, on that disease. So we were actually very lucky to work with the dermatology team at St. Paul's and two fellows that were really keen on this to come up with that algorithm. So that algorithm didn't just came up from Judith sitting in front of her computer. There was actually a lot of people that were very interested in this. So the way that we um, did it was uh, we decided first like general history of what is happening for the patient was something that was very important to go through. And uh, uh, pruritus related to chronic kidney disease, like there shouldn't be any lesion then if the patient is like scratching themselves and like scarring their skin, but there shouldn't be any other lesion. 
So if there is lesion, then you should refer to dermatology. If not, you can go through the other reason why, like other source of pruritus that are related to no lesion. So for example, malignancy or hematological reason and so forth. If the patient is on dialysis, there is other source also that you can go and look for. Like for example, if there has been change in the dialyzer or if there could be some he uh, heparin allergies. And then after that comes the non-pharmacological uh, tips that we can give to the patient. And all of these non-pharmacological tips are actually on the patient info sheet. So you don't need to read them all to the patient. You can just try to find a few things that they can modify, but then just give the patient info sheet to the patient and they can go back home and read them and see if there is a few things that they can modify. Um, our uh, dermatology team was also very nice to give us a bunch of cream that they are recommending to patients. And it goes from like, very cheap creams like laxal based to very expensive creams like Lipicar. And so they gave us a wide variety of different, uh, different cream that a patient could look for in pharmacy. And then basically based on the literature and everything they, they were saying, like there is no, like the oral therapy that we have are actually really, really poor. Like at that point, if this is not helpful, patients should just be referred for, to dermatology for UVB treatment. That's basically. The other things, like we, we kept uh, antihistamine in there. They're probably not working. They probably just put them to sleep. But if that helps them to go through, because usually they are very fatigued because they can't sleep at night because of the pruritus. So if that can help to manage the symptoms while they are waiting for dermatology, well, be it. Gabapentin, there is a bit of data also with that and with pregabalin. Sertraline, there is a bit of data too, and um, and then I mean it's rare that it's tolerated, but there is a bit of data also with doxepin. So, and in terms of what is covered by the uh, BC Renal Agency, the oral antihistamine are covered, the gabapentin is covered, and uh, our dermatology <laughs> team was uh, nice enough also to give us a bit of a, a new and improved uh, compound cream. <laughs> With, their, uh, with a bit of menthol and a bit of camphor. So they were recommending often that, and that I mean, other than the cooling effect, it's probably not doing too, too much, but if it can help with the symptoms with the patient, and it's not very irritant. So this cream is actually also now covered by the BCPRA, and we, uh, we baptize it the BCPRA pruritus cream. So. <laughs> there you go. But it's not like there is a lot of data for that too, but it's probably not very harmful. And if it helps the patient, then be it. Um, oh, shoot. Now I'm in trouble again. Sorry, Yvonne. OK. Oh, here. Maybe we're good. We're back. Okay, and I'm just going to show you. Oh, here you go. So that's the BCPRA patient info sheet with everything uh, that has been looked at, like in terms of like appropriate language for patients. And whoops, how do you go down? Sorry, I can't move it here. But all like the non the uh, creams recommended are also there, and all the um, recommendation, non-pharmacological recommendation, recommend, oh, perfect, recommendation are also on the sheet. All the sheets are actually built the same way. There is a, at the beginning, there is a paragraph on what the symptom is all about, some things that they might be experiencing, and then some non-pharmacological recommendation. For certain condition, like muscle cramp, we added, like for example, vitamin E in there with the caveat to ask their healthcare professional if that was actually appropriate for them. But at least they have a few things that they can manage on their own with this. And, uh, oh, can we go back? Oh, and here. And this is like the patient information sheet with gabapentin, and most of like the, oops, and most of um, 
the information has been updated also to be current with what we're saying and the appropriate information for that are ad that are adapted also for renal patient are uh, also on this information sheet. So now I'm going to I'm going to give the stage to Yvonne and she's going to chat with you about she's going to uh, show you one of the guidelines the poor appetite guideline. No, it's a faux pocket. Good afternoon. Oh, am I off? Is it on? Okay, great. Um, I'm going to get the clicker. And let's see if this works. Okay, so thank you, Judith. Um, so in contrast to um, Judith's discussion of the um, algorithms, I'm going to talk about one of the guidelines. So um, that guideline in particular is about poor appetite. Um, and as Judith already mentioned, poor appetite is, is very frequent in our patients, and up to about 50% in CKD, depending on the stage, are going to be complaining of poor appetite. Um, <clears throat> we know um, that poor appetite is related to uremia, um, complications of CKD in itself, but also other comorbidities to consider, like CHF, um, diabetic gastroparesis we see very often. Um, definitely the poor appetite can worsen with the progression of CKD and can lead to malnutrition. Um, often in clinic, we may see patients who are actually happy they're eating less. They're like, oh, I've lost weight. This is a good thing. But it is not a good thing. <laughs> um, we know that that unintentional weight loss is, is likely due to um, uh, inflammation, poor appetite. It's going to be muscle mass and it's going to contribute to this uh, muscle wasting and malnutrition. So nutrition status is an important factor in dialysis and transplant outcomes. A little reminder. Um, Studies have shown that if patients start dialysis malnourished, they're three times more likely to die in the first three years than if they're well nourished. So very important. Early diagnosis and treatment, very important for the prognosis of these patients and costs us less money. Um, I never want to forget about quality of life. Um, low appetite, of course, impacts your quality of life and an enjoyment of food is um, very significant. Uh, goals of care, important to consider when we're looking at um, these nutrition-related um, symptoms like poor appetite. And sometimes it's important to educate the patient and the family that this reduction in appetite may be a part of the natural progression of the disease and or aging. And the focus on sort of balancing this oral intake with quality of life is important. And now, that said, it doesn't mean that we're not going to address any strategies for poor appetite with someone who's chosen conservative care but it would certainly um, would change our, our approach. Okay, so I'm going to turn to a little bit of a case study. Um, this is Mr. X. He's a KCC patient, 72 years old, stage 4 um, kidney disease. He's coming to our clinic about every three months. GFR is steadily declining. Medical history includes, among other things, hypertension, diabetes. Um, oh, this is, anyways. Um, he's about 90 kilograms, 180 centimeters, so slightly above his ideal um, weight range. Weight looks like it's about stable, but if we look at the nurse's note, she's noting quite a bit of edema, so likely um, losing some um, muscle, uh, lean tissue body weight. Labs looking okay in terms of potassium is low, normal, except for you'll note he's also on k um, Calcium phosphorus there, you can read 1.3, 2.3. 1, 2, albumin 35, and his GFR is 12. Um, meds include, among others, Caxlate, Ramapril, and his insulin. Um, he, his ESAS score is 7, which is very high. And to be honest, I think my edited version of this was a little bit lower. Um, but so maximum score being 10, he's now um, scoring 7. Um, dramatic change from his last visit, which was about 3, let's say. Okay, <clears throat> now I think um, Judith has already mentioned this in terms of um, the poor appetite um, guideline is not an algorithm, but a guideline is divided into the three sections. There is a lot of evidence on malnutrition in poor appetite in CKD, but limited in terms of treatment. So for this algorithm, we looked at cancer care and palliative care. Okay, so I'm going to go right to... Oh, this is... Oh dear. 
I'm going to go right to the website. And I apologize because this was not the way it looked at 1.30. <laughs> I had the link right in there. Oh, oh, it's not up there. It's still Gabba Oh, no, no, no. Okay. Yeah. It's weird because. Oh. It's coming. I think it. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, I thought I could zoom in, but maybe I can't. <laughs> okay. Oh, here we go. Okay. So as you can see, the poor appetite guideline is divided into the three sections. And if you can stay there and scroll for me, that would be <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Um, so the first section is assessment. So on you know, the duration, his change in oral intake, um, weight, take, stop, uh, lean body mass, um, whether or not um, there's any other um, factors that might be contributing, such as glycemic control, depression, um, anxiety, um, constipation, etc. So for the purposes of today, let's say this gentleman has had just one month, all of a sudden his appetite's gone down, his actual body weight has stayed the same, but likely lost lean body mass because he's a dematis. Um, he's complaining of early satiety, may or may not be related to long history of diabetes. <coughs> Um, and kind of found he can't really eat meat anymore. He used to be a big steak eater, totally aversion to um, meat now. Um, so we go through sort of the assessment of that, noting all those um, factors, and then go to the non-pharmacological strategies. Thank you. So <clears throat> first of all, in no particular order, we would liberalize uh, diet restrictions, um, the salt, the phosphorus, the potassium. So let's say he reports he's eating 50% some days, 75 the other days. Naturally, his diet's going to be lower in the um, salt, phosphorus, potassium. So definitely room to liberalize that. Um, tips in terms of small frequent meals, um, maybe drinking liquids between his meals to avoid the early satiety, particularly um, related to the diabetic gastroparesis, if that is one of the factors. Um, he's a single guy. He's maybe had some fatigue as well. Um, meal delivery services, grocery delivery services might be appropriate. Um, physical activity definitely stimulates the appetite, and I think this is an underused um, treatment strategy for sure. Um, and then lastly, consider oral nutrition supplements like Nepro, Suplena, and Sure Those. Um, at the bottom, it does have pharmacological in interventions, but you'll note for appetite, there really aren't any. <laughs> um, Megase has not clearly shown to be advantageous in this population is not recommended. For chemo patients, IDPN might be appropriate. Um, but other than that, we go above to the non-pharmacological. So I will show the teaching tools as well, if you can pull that up. Sorry, the link. So those non-pharmacological um, strategies are also noted on the patient teaching tools. And the BC Renal Dietitians Group actually made up um, this set of handouts, which includes tips for nausea, um, poor appetite, taste changes, and then some really practical tips in terms of how to liberalize diet. What foods are you going to increase um, to increase your calories, increase your protein, and your intake? So this one is up for nausea. That's not this gentleman's um, trouble right now. If you can scroll down. Thank you. Then um, tips for people with poor appetite. So one I really like is setting the alarm. Most people have their phone on them a lot, so setting an alarm on your phone to remind you to eat more frequently. It's easy to say, you know, eat frequent meals, but to actually do it is quite different. Um, keep scrolling down for me, and I'll just point out sort of the handout. So that's about the appetite. It has some, qu some quick, easy tips. Taste changes, some tips tried and true. Um, he's got a little bit of um, that meat aversion and, and um, metallic taste, so plastic utensils might be an option, brushing his teeth more often. Uh, okay, scroll down a little bit for me, thank you. 
and then include some tips for how to increase calories in terms of um, liberalizing the fats, liberalizing the carbohydrates, et cetera. And then the last one, I believe, is some um, specific kidney-friendly meal and snack ideas, so some real practical um, foods that you can include in your diet. So if you can go back one more time to the presentation, sorry. So just kind of putting it together with this patient, um, you could, I certainly wouldn't give all of these handouts all at the same time to one person. I think it'd be far too um, overwhelming, but the clinician could choose which ones are appropriate for this patient. Circle, highlight the ones that they think the patient's like, yeah, I could do that. Um, and then these could be the recommendations. So they could maybe liberalize, go back to their favorite stack of nuts. Their phosphorus and their potassium are fine right now. Maybe continue the KX light to allow them to liberalize that diet. Aim for the six pound meals, alarm on the phone, the liquid. Um, write down some real specific ideas. And then the dietitian would likely follow up in a week and see how things are going. Have they been able to do it? If not, maybe they can get the meal frequency up, but the protein's not appropriate. Then maybe then like Nepro, Saplena, one of the nutrition supplements might be appropriate. And of course, continue to liaise with the team about the plan in terms of dialysis or transplant. Okay, I'll give it back to Judith. Okay, and I just realized when um, Yvonne was showing the uh, guidelines, so all the algorithms at the end of them, there is actually a full document uh, summarizing all the evidence. So if you're not sure where the recommendations are coming from or what are the therapy that we were considering had neutral effect or had uh, were not were negative trials. You can just scroll down a little bit, and all the literature about the algorithm is actually all summarized there. Um, so, and then the whoopsie. Okay, and then that's the last part. So, um, what is next? I mean, there is still some algorithms that would that could be done or needs to be done. Uh, if anybody is interested, please let me know. <laughs> I'm always recruiting people for these type of things. Uh, but uh, right now also what I'm doing with Hillary at the back there is we're actually evaluating the symptoms algorithms in terms of um, seeing how uh, the nurses and the dietitian like using them if they see if they if their perception is, is that this is helpful for their patient. And then we're actually gonna also interview some patients that are receiving the patient information sheet to see if that has been helpful, if the interaction that they've had with the healthcare provider on that have actually been also helpful to help their symptoms. Because at the end of the day, why we do all that is to improve their quality of life and make sure that this makes them feel better. So this is what's going on right now. And I'm happy to take, or we are happy to take any questions, comments. Table is turned on your hand. Yeah, yeah. So now, for, uh, for what? For the, so we, there is no cap. However, it's for CKD with EGFR lower than 15 ml per minute. So. Uh, Saying that, I think that if a patient has some symptoms of, I don't know, horrible muscle cramps and the EGFR is 16, I think that nobody will be very upset about you applying for the formulary. Um, the, the only thing that you need to write on the prescription is that patient has EGFR lower than 15 ml per minute. And as soon as this is specified and sent to a renal pharmacy, they will actually, uh, the, the the cost of the medication will actually be billed to PRA. So thank you, uh, uh, Judith and Yvonne, and, and thank you, Cliff Lowe. Uh, <laughs> I think that the person in the vision wants to give them 
in the biggest volume of climate treatment and then as a result of the earthquake they have a better anticipated case all the way Not everybody is computer savvy who is 65 going higher. Mm -hmm. And all of them don't have all the material to do that. So I'm just asking, have you got a technique involved that you could work for and the good ministerial with your earthquake further explanation before you do that? I mean, I'm sure that all the education that you're doing in your office cannot repla <laughs> won't replace all these. She, but we've tried to make it as patient accessible as possible through the BCPRA website, but I totally agree with you that it's, for a lot of patients, it's not something that it's easy to find. Googling it, though, you can get these algorithms right away. If you just put BC Renal Agency, nausea, these, these documents will pop up right away. But it's not. Uh, I agree. I'm just saying that the next step is to hear the word organ, provide it for them, and make sure that you tell them what you want. Be perfect. Be yeah. And, yeah and, and, and in our clinic, we do, we do do that. Like I have all the patient information sheet. I even have the algorithms all printed. And I, we actually go through it with them. We actually also try to do the ESAS in the waiting room before they see anybody else, so that as soon as we see the ESAS, we exactly know what to approach, and for them to go with the patient information sheet throughout their visit, so that even if they have a few minutes to wait before seeing the dietitian or before seeing me, they can all already start reviewing things, so that if they have any questions, they can ask us right away. But for sure, having the information available right away is actually quite important. and. But having them on the website, if people know where to find them, if there is a computer in the uh, in the interview room, it's probably actually quite easy also to go and print. So this initiative has been really good. I see an evolution starting with uh, really good and new algorithms all the way back then, and then pain, and then all these other algorithms. So one of the mandates is for BC Renal Agency is to um, <coughs> Come up with guidelines and standardized care where it's reasonable and practical and there's good reason to do so. And so, this is an evolution of that. Uh, and we, and through this, uh, we created these algorithms for dialysis, so this is taking a step into the uh, chronic kidney disease realm. And the notion of EGFR under 15 uh, comes also from a very simple that if somebody is elected conservative care, why in making that decision? Should they be burdened for paying for their medication? So it's about equitable access and to support their decision. Uh, so, you know, uh, from the pharmacy to the reasonable care, uh, you know, this is a, a reasonable approach. And, uh, you know, it could be that the patient's stable and it can be a as well. Uh, so be it. They still have the symptoms, and, and uh, uh, we did a business uh, impact analysis uh, to figure out how many patients we're talking about and the cost. And we found that it was quite quite doable across the street. So, uh, you know, treating symptoms and improving quality of life uh, as best we can. And as Judith alluded, you know, some of the evidence is something spectacular. And if you're a clinician who you know, always treats the use of medication in this way and it really works, uh, fantastic. Uh, hopefully it's one of the medications you chose to find. Um, but uh, uh, this, this is a step in the right direction. So if we start to use these pathways, these suggestions, and you find success with it, or if you find it problematic, let us know so we find it so we can get you a better place in the future, nothing's written in stone. This is all relatively new in terms of PC because it's just August that we're finally got all this together and <coughs> loaded up. Please visit the website to redesign the, where things are on the website and their accessibility, so hopefully that's easy to navigate. Um, take a look uh, and uh, whether you're in a clinic setting, you can print these documents off the patients. Whether you're in a pharmacy uh, working in a sales setting, uh, you can print these documents off. You can refer patients to these uh, documents. And I think the non pharmacologic piece uh, is really helpful to patients to keep the things they can buy realistically uh, you know, and, uh, and hopefully get their quality of life uh, improved. So uh, if you have any specific questions about formulary or and I just want to say also, like Dan also mentioned, like the 
the data are really, really poor. So if anybody has any interest on evaluating these algorithms and putting them in a real size setting and seeing how they work, like we're very happy to contribute and to help. And so that, that would be I mean, really helpful. For cramping. Yeah, there's been actually, so <laughs> that was one of the, <laughs> one of the, the, the thing, the, one of the, we had a lot of discussion about the, the muscle cramp algorithm. So Quinine uh, was, uh, we evaluated it, looked at uh, the Health Canada warning and everything and decided that uh, we would like to get away from Quinine being uh, on the BCPRA formulary. There is not a lot of other options. Like vitamin E has been studied with some success, gabapentin too. And so in this setting, we decided that these were probably better options, safer options for the patient. And so vitamin E, one study was done just with vitamin E, another one with actually vitamin D and a vitamin C, vitamin B supplement. So actually quite close to Replevite. We decided to not go with this option, but just write vitamin E, and then people can choose whatever they're doing. Anyway, if they're on dialysis, most of them are also on Replevite, so we decided to just leave it as that. But there is some data that actually vitamin E decreases the frequency and the intensity of cramp. Um, I use it in my CKD patient. It's a hit or miss, but I think that cramp is also very difficult because it doesn't happen often every day. It have, it's more sporadic, and also it's when they are dehydrated, if their calcium is kind of on the lower and like there's a lot of factors playing so um, yeah. some people say that it's been very very helpful some people say that it's not helpful at all so but that is like n of one so it, all these things would be really interesting if people would want to take them on and study them like in a more rigorous fashion but it's difficult well, my, uh, you know, the world is in hospital. Uh, I think we had uh, impressive pictures of patients on screen, uh, and I managed to get the last few shots of the hospital. Um, and uh, uh, it's clearly the success. Clearly, a number of people who have had a chance to watch mm -hmm. the video sooner so they can write that word and share the pictures of that. I think we're happy to have the pictures of that on the screen. Uh, but uh, I, I had to be forced to write it. Early, early days yet, but uh, mm -hmm. it seems to be successful. There's a number of other drugs we're getting uh, we're removing from formulary. Uh, Anacipaline, going to different new anacipaline to be used. Uh, Carbonate seems to be going to uh, be uh, uh, clonazepam as well. Uh, the evidence seems to suggest it works for less than my uh, so <laughs> What else? I think, but then we're adding also uh, the dopamine agonist for restless legs. We're also adding, um, oh, I would have to, like we're, we stopped sorbitol also on the formulary for constipation, but added a uh, PEG uh, without electrolytes. Um, so there's been a few, but I don't think that no conditions have actually been left dry without any options. Like there is all, at least two options per condition. And for patients who are on these therapies that we removed from formulary, uh, they can remain on these until the end of uh, May 2018. So it's a kind of a grandfather for those people on them to give the community time to transition people <coughs> over to uh, another formulary alternative. Uh, but in the case of quitting, uh, for instance, and if we look like at our St. Paul's uh, Dallas hemo unit, there's not been anybody on quinine for, I think, when he was saying two years or something like that. So they've been able to get away from this without any patient being feeling like they are not being able to get their dialysis treatment. So they've been quite successful. Yeah. I'm sorry, Alex. 400 units daily. It's 400 units daily. One dose, yeah. 
that was that's what was studied. So uh, the question was about um, uh, CPAs, calcium phosphorus uh, algorithm. Uh, we have a CK0 on the website um, because there wasn't any uh, one way of choosing you know, those authorities. Um, so we couldn't have one way of doing it as well. Uh, that being said, we looked at the CK0 and the state of the and we adopted that as their algorithm. So health authorities can, can take that and use it. So we're, we're trying to address as many of the symptoms uh, and uh, conditions that renal patients have that can determine their health uh, in that field. Uh, so we're, we're willing to do them, but um, some remain uh, uh, suggestions of course, guidelines. And for instance, anemia is quite clear. Uh, it's quite clear how to proceed with that and, and have great success. Uh, the figures to date uh, over the years of the algorithm have probably been like uh, drug toxin. So, and it's not just about saving money. Patients get into target sooner, stay into target longer, and avoid the severe uh, adverse events of uh, MRI scoring, mm -hmm. hypertension, hospitalization, cancer, uh, radiation, and so on. Um, so, uh, I guess what we're looking, we're looking for is feedback as, as we uh, look at the, these tools and hand them to patients, patients feedback to you, feedback to us, suggestions for improvement. All uh, and the students had uh, uh, an interest to get involved in what the dog did for them. <coughs> so uh, you can um, uh, send it to uh, Judith. Uh, uh, she'll pop up my emails on the website, and then we can uh, share the funds and help us to continue to get the All right, well, uh, thank you very much. Thank you.